Well, good morning, everyone. If you have not had an opportunity to meet, I'm Pastor Mark, and I'm so glad that you're here on this very first Sunday of Lent. I also want to welcome all of you who are watching online. You're an important part of our congregation. And uh, we're starting a brand new series today on Jesus in the Gospel of Luke. And I'd like to start uh, with a story of when I was young. When I was in sixth grade, I played basketball on Sunday night after a youth group. Uh, Two older boys were assigned to be captains, and then, one at a time, they would choose teammates, starting with the strongest, most athletic kids, and working their way down. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? I was often the youngest in the group, and although I was a really good one-on-one player, I was not very good at playing full court with teams of five. So there I was standing awkwardly among the other boys, trying to act cool, you know, hoping not to be picked last. Those picked last were the kids that no one really wanted on their team. But unfortunately, throughout my sixth grade year, I was almost always picked last, which left me feeling weird and unwanted. Even worse, some of you guys out there are going to identify with this. Even worse, once the teams were picked, they were divided into shirts and skins. And I always prayed that the team forced to pick me would be shirts so that I would not have to stand on the sideline self-conscious of what the older guys called baby fat. (laughs) Having to take my shirt off made me feel even more like an outsider. I'm sure that you could tell similar stories. And I encourage you this morning to recall times in your life when you felt like an outsider. How did it feel? Did you feel rejected, ashamed, or even humiliated? Did you feel less than or left out? Did you want to run away and hide, or did you want to lash out in anger? The good news of the message today is that Jesus, according to the Gospel of Luke, had a special heart for those who felt unwanted. As we will see throughout his ministry, he reached out actively to sinners, tax collectors, and prostitutes, those considered outcasts, outsiders, and outlaws. Jesus actively sought out these people. He befriended them and empowered them to do some pretty awesome things in God's rescue mission of this world. But before we jump into the Gospel of Luke for the next six weeks, it might be helpful to share some key points about this book of the Bible. Most mainline scholars say that Luke was written toward the end of the first century, around A.D. 75 and 90, between that time period. The writing itself, interestingly enough, does not identify an author, but Christian tradition associates it with a physician and companion of the Apostle Paul, whose name was Luke. The gospel is addressed to a man named Theophilus, who may have commissioned and financed the writing of this gospel. In the introduction, Luke expresses his purpose for writing this gospel, which is to write a carefully ordered account of the life of Jesus, having investigated everything carefully so that his audience would have confidence in its veracity. Some of the most beloved parables and stories are found only in the gospel of Luke including the story of Zacchaeus, which Jim Harnish read last Sunday, the parable of the rich man and Lazarus, the parable of the Good Samaritan, only in Luke, the parable of the prodigal son, only in Luke, and Jesus' resurrection appearances on the road to Emmaus. It also includes the angel's appearance to Zechariah and to Mary, as well as the nativity story that most of us tell at Christmas. If we pay close attention to the stories that are unique to Luke, those not found in any other gospel, we begin 
to see something very unique about Jesus, especially considering that he was a Jewish rabbi, namely his love for the marginalized, the broken, the lonely, the unseen, and the unwanted. I'd like to begin this morning with the angel Gabriel's announcement to Zechariah that his wife Elizabeth would bear a son, and we have the scripture reading behind me this morning. It says in Luke 1, beginning with verse 5, in the time of King Herod, in the time of Herod, the king of Judah, there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly division of Abijah. His wife, Elizabeth, was also a descendant of Aaron. Both of them were righteous in the sight of God, observing all the Lord's commands and decrees blamelessly. But they were childless because Elizabeth was not able to conceive. Read this last part with me. And they were both very old. (laughs) Note that Zechariah and Elizabeth are described as very old. While in principle, elderly folks had a place of honor in the ancient world, in everyday life there was likely ageism then, just as there is today. In a recent national study, 80% of adults aged 50 to 80 indicated that they experienced some form of age discrimination, which I didn't pay much attention to until this year when I'm turning 50. (laughs) One example of this can be found in the lawsuits filed by female anchor persons who were released from their jobs as they got older and were replaced by women much younger for no apparent reason other than their age was showing. And this did not happen to their male counterparts. And as you know, the church is not immune from the problems that crop up in the surrounding culture. And ageism is no exception. There's a standing joke among clergy that declining churches often think that the solution to all of their problems is just to get a young pastor who's married with kids. And the tendency to devalue older adults is experienced by parishioners as well, who sometimes feel like the church that they grew up in is disappearing with the rise of modern trends. Some so-called contemporary or community churches seem to exclusively focus on young families with children. I have noticed that in some of these churches, there are no older adults attending worship. None. No ministry specifically for seniors. And no consideration of older adults when making key decisions. And what's even more problematic is that this does not even register on the consciousness of some pastors, which means that they don't even see it as a problem. They just rejoice all the young families that are coming to their church. In sharp contrast, the Gospel of Luke starts with God choosing a couple that is described as very old despite their age, or perhaps because of it, God chose Elizabeth and Zechariah to be the parents of John the Baptist, who would play a crucial role in God's rescue mission of the world by preparing the way for Jesus. Importantly, this theme of God choosing old people to do new works can be seen throughout the Bible. Remember that Abraham and Sarah were 100 years old and 90 years old, respectively, when God gave them a son, Isaac, to fulfill the promise that he would make them a great nation. And Moses was 80 when God called him to lead the nagging, complaining Israelites out of Egypt. I am proud to say that our church is composed of many older adults And they are a tremendous gift to all of us. I think of Gloria Vaughn, who gives me a hug every Sunday morning, and who for a long time provided homemade food for the new people in our church through the Explorers Luncheon. 
I think of Jim and Judy Hale who tirelessly work in the prayer garden, not only to keep it looking nice, but to honor all of the people who have been laid to rest in this sacred place. I think of Tim and Josie Taylor who come every Sunday, and not just on Sunday to offer service, but especially when we're decorating for the season of Christmas and Lent, and we have a hard time getting people to help. And uh, Josie has all the knowledge of how to set this stuff up. They work tirelessly. I think of Nora and Don Heibarger, who show up every Sunday to perform, uh, to give, provide warm hospitality, and Mary Russell, who makes me collard greens and brings them to the parsonage as an occasional treat, just because she knows they remind me of my grandmother. I think of Annetta Gross, who advocates for all of the seniors in the church and makes sure that none of us forget about those who can't attend in person. I think of Betty Ranson, who was shut in at Solaris. It makes me feel so loved and valued. Every time I visit with her and her daughter, Nancy. I think of charter member Helen Wilkins, who is 102 and demonstrates extravagant generosity to our, to our church by continuing to mail her tithe, even though she's not been able to attend in person for years. I could go on and on, and I don't want to leave anybody out, but there are so many examples. And all of our older adults are a tremendous gift to this church, bringing things like wisdom, experience, and leadership. The Bible makes clear that we never retire from the work that God has called us to do. In whatever stage of life we find ourselves, God seeks to use us in important ways. In addition to being very old, Zachariah and Elizabeth were also infertile. The biological causes of infertility were not well understood in the ancient world, and many people saw it as a sign of God's judgment. It was often a source of shame and disgrace, making them feel like an outsider in their own community, sometimes in their own family. Like Zachariah and Elizabeth, many people today, including people in our church, experience infertility as a source of pain. And some are left wondering, where in the world is God in the midst of all of my heartache? Contrary to ancient culture, we see throughout the Bible that infertility is not a sign of divine judgment. In fact, we see something very different, that God has a special place in his heart for couples that wrestle with this unique pain and seeks to extend compassion and love to heal them. Also, when part of God's rescue plan required a baby to be born, God often chose to work through infertile couples. Again, remember Abraham and Sarah, but also Isaac and Rebekah and Jacob and Rachel. So the story of Zechariah and Elizabeth is simply a continuation of this theme of how God loves and works through couples who struggle with infertility. In addition to choosing the elderly, it's also important to remember that God chooses and uses young people, including teenagers. And I want to speak directly to our youth that are here this morning. I've asked them to stay in the service and not be dismissed to their program to hear this. It says in Luke chapter 1, beginning with verse 26, that the angel Gabriel appeared to Mary and told her that she was going to give birth to Jesus, the Son of God, the Savior of the world. And I'm sure that you've heard this story around Christmas time, but what you might not know is that most scholars believe that Mary was around 13 or 14 years old. Again, this is not something new with the Gospel of Luke. We see God choosing young people throughout Scripture. Remember that David was just a little boy when he fought and defeated the giant Goliath. Esther was a young princess who saved the Jewish people from genocide. And Timothy was a young man who was mentored by the Apostle Paul and served as an important leader in the early church. And I want to pause this morning and invite every single person here to consider the youth who attend our church. Perhaps you haven't met them. Meet Isaac and Riley and Preston and Dalton and Paige and Bethany and Joshua. 
If you've not had a chance to get to know these young adults, they are incredible people. And what you may not know is that some of them serve in the food pantry every month. Some of them play in the praise band. Some of them are really good at showing love and acceptance to other teens in the youth program so that they have a sense of belonging. And if you were a teenager in attendance this morning, I know that sometimes you may feel out of place in a church full of adults, like an outsider. Maybe you don't think that you have anything to offer and only come because your parents force you to do so. And I want to say that you're not crazy for feeling this way. Unfortunately, older people sometimes do look down on teens and dismiss them as naive or judge them as weird. (laughs) And again, the church is not immune from this. But I want you to know that you are important to us. You have gifts and talents that this church needs. You belong here. You have an important role to play. And our job is not only to help your parents discover their gifts and graces, but to help you as well. And just like the people here that you see as old, including me probably, your value is also affirmed by God in Scripture. It says in 1 Timothy 412. Do not let anyone look down on you because you were young, but set an example for the believers in speech and conduct and love and faith and impurity. So in summary, God chooses and uses both the very old and the very young, despite our tendency to dismiss both groups as having nothing to contribute. God's choice of the old and the young illustrates Jesus' appeal to the outsiders and outcasts and God's purposes of lifting up the lowly, which brings us to our last point, that God is in the business of lifting up the lowly. It says in Luke 1, beginning with verse 46, that Mary sang a beautiful song. We call it the Magnificat, and I apologize if the words are too small to read. Um, I have to fall on my sword. I made the visual presentation, and so if you can't read it, then that's just another reminder that you need to bring your Bible so that you can read along with me. After hearing and accepting the call to be the mother of the Son of God, (laughs) Mary sings, My soul magnifies the Lord. And my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. For he, was, he has looked with favor on what? The lowly state of his servant. Surely from now on, all generations will call me blessed. For the mighty one has done great things for me. And holy is his name. Indeed, his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. He has brought down the powerful from their thrones. And what he did in ancient times, he will do today. And has lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty because they have enough. Many people see these words as a revelation of a great reversal initiated by the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. Especially in the Gospel of Luke, we see God and Christ lifting up those of low status. So who exactly are these lowly people? We find an answer to this question in the Hebrew phrase, Am Ha-Aretz, which literally means people of the land. In first century Judaism, this phrase was often used in a disparaging way to describe people who were uneducated or uncouth. It was a condescending term meant to imply that someone was ignorant or unsophisticated. Think of blue-collar workers or those described as low class today. It would be like calling someone a redneck, a yokel, a country bumpkin, 
a hillbilly, a yahoo, a clodhopper, or as my grandma would say, an ignoramus. <laughs> it was really fun looking up synonyms for amha aretz. It is the opposite of highbrow, cultured folks. And yet in the Gospels, especially in the Gospel of Luke, we find Jesus seeking out, ministering to, and lifting up the Amha Aretz as beloved children of God. Remember that Jesus' mother Mary and her fiancé Joseph were probably considered Amha Aretz because of their being from Nazareth and Joseph being a tradesman. For this reason, Jesus himself would have been regarded among the lowly, a fact that is illustrated in the story of his birth, where he is born in a barn and laid in an animal feeding trough. Some of Jesus' disciples, especially the fishermen, would likely be considered Amha Aretz. Of all the people he could have chosen, now remember, he was a rabbi. A Jewish rabbi. Jewish rabbis, when they go out looking for disciples, they're looking for the best of the best. They're looking for the smartest and the brightest and the most educated and the most sophisticated and the most cultured. And of all the people that Jesus could have chosen, these are the unlikely ones that he sought out, taught, empowered, and worked with to carry out God's mission in the world. It's astonishing. And I think that this is a really important point for those of us who live on the Space Coast. Are you awake, church? Demographics show that the people who live in our town are significantly above the national average in terms of education and wealth. And this can easily become a source of pride that causes us to look down upon disregard, and even disdain people perceived as less educated, less sophisticated, working class, low class, or poor. One of the greatest gifts that I received growing up in the Salvation Army was constant exposure to the poorest people in town, the homeless. And I remember one time when I was a kid in a Sunday night service when all the men from the homeless shelter were required to attend. I started acting wor you know, kind of rude and squirmy because a homeless man sitting close to us smelled so bad. And I will never forget my mother giving me a stern look and whispering, you better stop. teaching me that this man was a child of God and it was sinful to make him feel unwelcome in God's house. When I was attending West End United Methodist Church in Nashville, which was, which was a very old, wealthy church, a homeless man with a pungent odor came into a Sunday school class I was attending, and we had a guest speaker that day. And the guest speaker went out of his way to give this man a bear hug. Now, I was sitting in the front, it was a big room. This guy was all the way in the back and I could smell him right when he came in. And I thought to myself, wow, that's astonishing. He just walked from the front to the back, gave the guy a bear hug, held his face in his hands and said to him, looking him in the eyes, you are a precious child of God. And tears, began streaming down the homeless man's face as his value was publicly affirmed. Perhaps for the first time ever. This embodiment of the heart of Christ also led me to cry tears of compassion and joy because I was seeing the kingdom of God unfold right before my eyes. This homeless man then attended worship and received a great gift, a safe place to lie down in a back pew and take a nap without fear of being assaulted.
Moments like this, my friends, are sacred. And they have a way of revealing the truth, a way of revealing the heart of God who is in the business of lifting up the lowly. In closing, I want to invite you to follow Jesus this morning by also seeking to lift up the lowly around you. Friends, God is still in the business of elevating people of low position, but these days he does it mostly through you and me. My hope is that as we hear the words of Mary, not only that we will hear the words of Mary in the Magnificat, not only as a promise, but also as a calling, that God brings down the powerful from their thrones and lifts up the lowly. Lifting up the lowly is an important way that we follow Jesus and partner with God in bringing about the great reversal we see in Luke. As we hear these words, I hope that we will respond with Mary. I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me just as you have said. There are many people among us setting a good example. Gail and the volunteers in our community food pantry lifted up the lowly last Sunday by feeding 30 families consisting of 85 people and 29 pets. And remember, our youth go to help them. Six people in our congregation have joined me in getting more educated about how to solve problems around affordable housing through, uh, through Brevard Justice Ministries. Our Minister of Children and Families, Kyra Langston, along with others in our church, lift up the lowly by helping people that are struggling not only with poverty but also addiction. As we begin the season of Lent, I invite you to be mindful of Jesus' own low status and to find ways that you personally can answer the call to lift up the lowly. And this, my friends, is the good news of the gospel this morning. Thanks be to God.